Hello, and welcome to Cathedra, the podcast for creatives, storytellers, worshipers, and artists in the body of Christ. I'm your host, Leland Mooring, and today's episode is titled, You're Not Done. In this episode, we will unearth what I like to call the kingdom economy of kindness through artistic gift giving. How art is not only a window into the glory of God, but also a healing balm for the broken heart. And what is the kingdom mentality of the believer artist who sees the current industry model as something God can work in and redeem, but never at the expense of the kingdom value of art? which is a dual purpose, first to reveal intimately the glory of God to a person, and second, to mend the brokenhearted from the pain of evil and suffering in a fallen world. I'm so excited to have you with me today. It's going to be an awesome conversation. Let's get into it. Well, hello. And welcome to Cathedra. My name is Leland Mooring. I'm so excited to have you. This is the podcast for creatives, storytellers, worshipers, and artists in the body of Christ. Um, I am really expecting about this episode. The title of this episode is You're Not Done. And our last episode, titled Yahweh, uh, we focused specifically on the name Yahweh, which means the breath of God. We talked about the life-giving spirit of the living God that wants to infuse and revive us as God's creatives and artists, His children in the earth today, that just like Moses said, God, how will they know that we're your people unless your presence goes with us? It's the presence of Jesus, the spirit of the living God, that is the demarcation on our lives as God's creatives, son and daughters in the earth today. Uh, But in this episode today, you're not done. We're going to discuss the economy of heaven concerning the arts. Um, I mentioned it in the opening that um, God began to speak to me about this, this economy of kindness through artistic gift giving. Uh, And the gospels are filled over and over and over with Jesus or his disciples. Uh, We also see it in, in Paul, in his letters, that this language about the kingdom of heaven. Uh, We see this phrase almost over and over in the gospels that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So when Jesus came, he came representing another kingdom. In Matthew, for instance, the Sermon on the Mount, that actually the the culture of heaven has a lot more to do, is that it's actually more intense than our culture in terms of um, morality and in terms of uh, character specifically, which is deeper than just moral actions. Uh, God doesn't just want us to do the right things, but he wants us to understand why Uh, we're called to do righteous works, that the righteousness of God extends from God's nature. It's who he is. It's how he thinks and feels about the world. So God doesn't not only want my obedience, but he also wants to reveal to my heart his ways, why God thinks the way he thinks. And so Jesus comes along and he says, yeah, you know, you've heard, you've heard it said that you can, you know, love your neighbor and then hate your enemy but I'm telling you, you actually have to love your enemy and pray for those who even want to persecute you. Um, you know, you've heard it eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. I tell you, if someone strikes you on the cheek, you got to turn the other. Um, if they ask for your, your jacket, you got to give them more of your possessions, give them your cloak too. Um, if they ask you to go one mile, go two. And so Jesus is telling us in these very drastic examples over and over again, that his kingdom operates differently. He said it to Peter when Peter tried to pick up the sword and defend Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter picks up the sword and we read it. You know, he lops off one of the guy's ears. (laughs) And yet Jesus says, you got to put that thing down, Peter. That's not how my kingdom operates. And so we see over and over this language about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And as you guys know, my heart, behind this podcast and where my heart has been for the last few years in my own personal life is, Jesus, you are the King of Kings. And if you are the King of Kings, then that means you have a culture. Heaven has a culture. So what is the culture of heaven concerning the arts? And every kingdom has an economy. What's the economy of heaven? What is God's economy look like? You know, we hear language all the time growing up about faith being sort of like this transactional thing. 
used in the economy of heaven. And I, I understand some of that language. I wonder more, though, if, if faith is like the perspective of Jesus and how he sees things, um, and less of like a an, an economic illustration. But when it comes to the arts, you know, you and I are creatives and artists living and breathing in the real world. And so I look at Jesus's life and I see that, man, Jesus lived a human life in within the context of the Roman Empire. You know, uh, we've spoke about it in other episodes, relative to Jesus's life and to his human life on the earth, the disciples and Christ were, were really walking around in their equivalent of a one world dictatorship. The Roman Empire ruled the known world. They were the, the largest military superpower. They were the largest economic uh, power on, on the face of the earth. And the Jews were a subjugated people group, you know, which is why Jesus talked about if a Roman soldier asked you to go with you one mile, it was very common that they were persecuted, they were taxed heavily, they were treated as lesser. And so here's Jesus living a human life, God in the flesh, living and breathing and moving in the world um, while operating from a, king, a different kingdom's mentality, from the kingdom of heaven. He was, he, was, he was on a mission from the Father to reveal the Father to the world and to reveal what the kingdom of heaven looked like by signs and wonders and miracles and by his character, by the way he sees the world. But while he's doing that, he's also having to navigate a fallen world. He's having to navigate a kingdom of darkness. Um, he's having to navigate the, the struggle against principalities and powers. Um, and we see that, for instance, in the story where Jesus is tempted by Satan, taken up to, Satan takes him to the highest pinnacle of this temple, and he reveals to Jesus, he shows him all of the kingdoms of the earth. And he says, to, he says to Jesus, this is crazy. He says, Jesus, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you all of these kingdoms and all of their glory. So right there, we see in that story, we know what, what happens. Jesus rebukes Satan. He says, I'm, you know, I'm, it is written, I'll only worship the Father and him alone. And Satan, you know, is, leaves his presence. The angels of God come and minister to Jesus. But we see in that story that there is a reality at work in the world that because the world is fallen from sin and death, there are, like Paul said, principalities and powers at work in the world trying to manipulate, called the spirit of the age, trying to manipulate things and trying to pollute the world with more sin and death. But our calling as ambassadors of heaven the Bible says in 1 John, we've, we've been given the authority to any who believe in Jesus. They now have the authority to be called sons and daughters of God. So we're sons of God now. We are free from sin and death, which means we're carriers of another kingdom. And we're called to live the same life Christ live, lived. We're called to operate in the world, walk in the world, like Paul said, in the world, but not of it. We're called to live in the world and to bring the great commission of the gospel, the truth of the gospel, to the, for, to the uttermost parts of the earth. What does that mean? That means everywhere we go, we are called to carry the culture of heaven into every single thing that we do, into how we speak, into how we live, and especially into how we interact with the creative arts. If you feel called to this as an artist, well, what's the culture of heaven concerning the arts? And so I want to take us to a couple of passages of scripture. We're going to read quite a bit of Bible today, and I hope that's okay. Um, I'm, we all love the Bible, so you can get your Bible out. I'm going to be reading through a few different um, sort of translations. Um, one is the Passion Translation, which is very new to me, um, but is it's really exciting. And then my standard that I go to a lot is the English Standard Version. I'm going to read some stuff out of that. And then I'm also going to read one passage out of the good old King James Bible, because it's just the best. It's so poetic. Um, but I want to start uh, with the same story, and we're going to read from Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 15. We also see this in, in, uh, in, in Luke 10, verses 1 through 12, but 
I want to read it out of Matthew. And I'm going to start here uh, with the Passion Translation. But if you have your Bible, you can go there with me. Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 15. This is where Jesus sends out the 12 disciples to go begin to preach that the kingdom of God is at hand. And he says this in verse 5. Jesus sent out the 12 with these instructions. This is the Passion Translation. He said, don't go into any Gentile or Samaritan territory. Go instead first and find the lost sheep among the house of Israel. And as you go, preach this message. Heaven's kingdom, this is really cool. And as you go, preach this message. Heaven's kingdom realm is accessible and close enough to touch. In the English standard, we, we see that classic phrase, preach this, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But I love this translation. Tell everyone the kingdom of heaven's realm is now accessible and close enough for you to touch. He said, you must continually bring healing to the lepers and to those who are sick. Make it your habit to break off the demonic presence from people and raise the dead back to life. Freely you have received the power of the kingdom, so freely release it to others. He said, you won't need a lot of money, travel light, don't even pack some extra change of clothes in your backpack. Trust God for everything because he knows who works for him deserves to be provided for. And whatever village or town you enter, search for an honorable man and whoever will let you into his home until you leave for the next town. Once you enter a house, speak to the family and say, God's blessing of peace be upon this place. And if those who are living there welcome you, let your peace come upon the house. But if you're rejected, that blessing of peace will come back upon you. And if anyone does not listen to you and reject your message when you leave that house or town, shake the dust off of your feet. Mark my words, on the day of judgment, the wicked people who lived in the land of Sodom and Gomorrah will have a lesser degree of judgment than the city that rejects you, for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah did not have the opportunity that was given to this town. Now remember, it is I who send you out. I love this. Even though you, f- you might feel vulnerable as lambs, going into a pack of wolves. So be as shrewd as snakes and yet as harmless as doves. That's just amazing to me. So Jesus is is already training his his disciples how to operate under another kingdom standard. He says, look, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. And he's not only just talking about men, but he's talking about the spirit that's at work in the world. He's talking about the spirit of the age that's at work, the principalities and powers that Paul talked about. And he says, look, you're going out as sheep amongst wolves, but my spirit in you, my presence in you is going to, my spirit's going to guide you. My words are going to instruct you to live as wise as serpents, but also as innocent as doves, to have the wisdom of heaven, but also the purity of the heart of Jesus. That holiness is loving what God loves and hating what God hates. Um, so I love this. Matthew 17, or Matthew chapter 10, that is just an amazing image for us to look at about the reality of this kingdom. That the kingdom of God, when Jesus came down into the earth, when he, when he condescended from his throne and he was born into the world, now the kingdom of heaven, he told them to, to preach saying, Tell them the kingdom of heaven is now accessible and near, so close that you can even touch it. I love that. That's amazing. I want to also take us to John um, John 18. This is another amazing passage of scripture, John chapter 18, with Jesus and Pilate, where Jesus talks about this other kingdom as well. This is amazing. If you got your Bible, you can go there with me. John 18, and we're going to look at verses 33 through 37. So this is Jesus. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version now. This is Jesus with Pilate. And um, let's see here. So Pilate entered, this is verse 33, uh, chapter 18 uh, in John. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called to Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief of priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting 
that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from this world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose, I was born. And for this purpose, I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth that everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Jesus is our king, the king of kings. He's our model how to live in a world that is polluted with sin and death, how to operate in it uh, with wisdom and understanding, with compassion and humility, but also um, how to demonstrate the kingdom and the culture of the kingdom of heaven in the midst of a fallen world. I love that John 18 passage. Um, and I, I'm, today I want to specifically focus on how does this relate to me as a creative and as an artist? We know about the, the economy of the arts today as, as it exists. Um, we're well aware of it, you know? It's probably one of the hardest things in the, in the world to do uh, to make money out of your art form. It's not impossible, but it's really, really difficult. It's the reason that most artists are broke. <laughs> um, I love this. Uh, Jordan Peterson said that the artists, what they tend to do is they move to the, uh, the cheapest part of town, which usually has a lot of crime and is, and is, you know, it's, it's got a lot of issues and, but that's where they can live because that's where they can afford to live and also have time to do their art. Over time, they make that place attractive and exciting because of the arts. And then entrepreneurs come in because they're a lot like artists and they love to take risks and they fill it with businesses and all sorts of economy grows. And then all of a sudden, then the lay person comes and it gets too expensive for the artist again. Then the artist moves to a new place. <laughs> and so I, uh, I sympathize with that a lot. Um, but I would say this, just because I live and breathe and move in the world, and I have to do things like pay bills and pay taxes and, um, and provide for my family, that does not mean that I have to then fully subjugate myself to the entire culture of, this, of the spirit of the age. That when it comes to the arts, there is an economy of heaven concerning the arts, that the value of art is not determined by the price someone is willing to pay for it in money. But the value of art is determined in two things. One, that good art reveals first more of the, of the nature of God. It's like a window into the face of God for the artist to commune back and forth with God, to have a language with God, a dialect. That's his first place of value. The second place of value for art is its impact it has the ability to make on the brokenhearted. Because life is filled with suffering and pain and all sorts of turmoil, we now have the opportunity as God's creative sons and daughters to sit down and co-labor with others, with one another, and with the Spirit to make things that are excellent, true, good, and beautiful, infused with the Spirit of God and the truth of the gospel that can then minister to the brokenhearted believer and non-believer, because each of us are human and we're all going through human things. And Christ is the son of man, Clement of Rome. Um, I believe it was Clement. It was either Clement or Athanasius. One of the, the, those church fathers said this. He said, whatever has not been assumed by the life of Christ has not been sanctified. And another way of saying that is, through Jesus' life, his human life on the earth, God was sanctifying all human endeavor as worship except sin. Everything except sin uh, is now worship unto God because Christ did those things. Christ sanctified humanity through his own life. And so we're called to mend the brokenhearted. We're called to preach the good news of the gospel. God's anointed us to preach the good news of the gospel, to set the captives free. We see in that story where Jesus told his disciples, you are, you are called, in the Passion Translation, you're called to, to remove off of people the demonic pressures of this world um, that torment people 
the, that the tormenting spirits that are on people's minds and hearts. We see that in the story of David, an amazing creative. Every time he played, Saul was able to come back into his right mind. That there was something about when David would play, all of a sudden Saul's insanity, where he was being tormented by all of these spirits, uh, something happened to his mind and, and a peace and a calm came over him. And so I believe that's, that's a, a larger image of what God's calling us to do, that, that the value of the art that you create and co-labor with your brothers and sisters in the Lord and, and with the Spirit, the value of it is not, it's not how many likes it gets, it's not how many views it gets, it's not how many spins or how much perceived influence or how much, uh, how much money it's able to generate. It's not how marketable, marketable it is. <laughs> The value of it is, is, in, is in those two divine places. The first is that it's something that you're able to commune back and forth with God, that God reveals himself to you through it. And second is that it has the ability to impact and mend the brokenhearted that exists within your sphere of influence. There are people in your world that are brokenhearted, and God has given you a gifting that is like a healing balm. It is like a healing oil that God wants to pour out through your life onto others in your world that have been touched by a fallen world. They've been touched by rejection. They have been touched by hatred and by real evil. And there's only only one thing that can heal them, and that's the love of God. And God expresses his love through his children by placing giftings and his spirit that God wants to anoint your gifting with the touch of his spirit, that it's the spirit of God. There's another scripture that says that before Jesus sent out the disciples, he breathed on them and said, be filled with the Holy Spirit. There is a breath of God, like we talked about in the last episode, that needs to come upon and infuse the gifting. The gifting is without repentance, but the gifting is not the same as fruit. Just because we're highly gifted doesn't mean that we are operating in spiritual fruit. But God's called us not just to be gifted, but he's called us to bear the fruit of his nature, the fruit of the kingdom of heaven. And the, the, the culture of the kingdom, remember, is the mind of Christ. So it's, it's the mind of Christ that God wants to fill us with and infuse us with that then produces the fruit of Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit everywhere we go. And people sense that through the art that you create. Um, well, I, I, I was going to share, I would encourage you later to take a look at Matthew 17 and Matthew 22. You can write these scriptures down later just to go read for more reference about the economic systems of the world versus the kingdom economy. So we see Jesus over and over living in the paradigm of of the kingdom of heaven while also operating in and moving in a world that is polluted by a kingdom of darkness filled with sin and death. And so he's our hope. He's our future. He's our model. So we're called to follow after him as as his creative sons and daughters. But I want to end with this last story uh, about the song. The title of this episode is You're Not Done. And so I wanted to specifically talk a little bit, uh, share with you a testimony or a story that I think ties into what we're talking about today. Hopefully this will be a good place to end today. During the height of the pandemic in 2020, we had we got news that a really close family friend of ours, a pastor in California, um, had, 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 um, had been infected with COVID um, and it had gotten really bad and it got to a point where he actually, his oxygen levels were very, very low and, uh, they had to move him and put him onto a ventilator. And, uh, he's, he wasn't a really, uh, wasn't very old, didn't have a lot of pre existing conditions. So it was just, it was really, it was just very aggressive. And so he's on a ventilator and things weren't looking good. And so the whole family, we just begin to pray. And I think a couple of weeks goes by and we keep getting text message updates over the course of the next like week or so 
that slowly his oxygen levels miraculously start to go up. Uh, we have we also lost friends during the pandemic to COVID, um, and and I'm sure some of you might have lost somebody. It's it's it, the the statistics of coming off a ventilator are not good, and so and we knew that, but we we began to pray, and miraculously, a few days in, is his oxygen levels start to go up, and so they start slowly weaning him off the vent, the ventilator. Um, about two weeks later, um, he's fully released from the hospital, comes home. It's a miracle. They like talk about it in the news. Uh, it was in the front page of their paper. Um, he was one of the few that were miraculously healed and we get on the phone with him and we're so excited to hear his voice that he's okay. We're talking to him and, uh, he says this, his name is Mark and, and, uh, he said, he said, Leland, he said, I've got to tell you this. And I was like, what? He said, this is so crazy. He said at the, there was a moment that was so bad where I was going in and out of consciousness, you know, slipping in and out because I was so weak and had such little oxygen. There was a moment where I felt that it was time for me to give up, that I just felt like maybe it's okay that I just let go. God's going to take care of my family and I can go be with Jesus. And as soon as that thought entered my mind, he said, I heard in the room, the doctor was playing music and they played your version of your recording of you singing Great Is Thy Faithfulness. He said, that's my favorite hymn. Is my favorite hymn in the world is Great Is Thy Faithfulness. He said, and you're one of my favorite singers. He said, I didn't even know you recorded that. And he's, he's like, but I heard this version of it. They had it on the room. And it's when your voice began to sing those words to my favorite hymn, he said, there was like this rush of the spirit of God that filled me. And it was like supernatural strength that I didn't have moments earlier. And I just felt the Spirit of God say, no, you're not done. You're not finished. And strength entered his body and it gave him enough energy to begin to fight and to stay alive. And he, he marks that as a turning point. Now, here's the wild part. When we're talking about two kingdoms, two economies and a kingdom that supersedes any other kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, and an economy that supersedes any other economy, the economy of heaven. This is the crazy part. Are you ready? <laughs> I have never recorded a version of Great is Thy Faithfulness. I've never done that. To the best of my knowledge, I have never recorded a version, studio or live, of the hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. I want to, but I've never done that. You can't find it anywhere. But what I have done many times is in the private place of my prayer closet or in, at home in my house or out on the road in a green room somewhere, I have many times sung that song that hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, to the Lord in prayer. The only thing I can figure that God did supernaturally is capture it somehow and play it for my friend Mark in his greatest time of need. I say all that to say this, that there are are more important things than the amount of money your art can generate. There are more valuable things than the amount of cultural influence your art can have. The most valuable thing outside of communing with the face of God that you can, that exists in this gifting of art is your ability to partner with the Spirit of God to make something beautiful that becomes a healing balm to the brokenhearted. I'm so excited that you joined me today. Thank you for coming along for this episode of Cathedra. 
and be on the lookout for future episodes. I pray that the grace of God and the peace of God and the Spirit of God would encourage you again into the culture of the kingdom of heaven and the economy of heaven concerning the arts, that you would see this gifting as not just uh, a, a tool to garner wealth into yourself, uh, earthly treasure, but you would see it as uh, an instrument of healing for the brokenhearted around you. I love you so much. Thank you for joining me, and we'll see you next time on the next episode of Cathedra.